Hello and welcome to Ignition and it's come round quickly but here we are with September's issue of Motor Trend. So I thought we'd have another look at it. Very very Bronco orientated this month and um, I'm not surprised. So let's crack on as there's, there's as you can see with the notes there there's quite a few to get through and the first one that I've picked out is ah now it's the Acura TLX now Many of, uh, I, I don't know whether how many of us in Europe know much about Acura, but basically it's um, Honda's, uh, Honda's version, it, it, uh, Lexus to Toyota and Infiniti to Nissan. It's been their sort of, uh, I'm assuming, premium brand, but it sort of died a death in the last couple of years, but they're apparently relaunching it as a performance brand and this TLX would appear to be the first sort of incarnation of it looks quite similar to the Civic Type R that we get in Europe but I don't think I don't think it is they don't really it, they don't really mention it in in this particular article but it's interesting to me because Theoretically, uh, you'd imagine that if, if you're producing a new vehicle in America, it will wander its way over to Europe eventually. But I, I just thought this was a particularly nice looking car. It's got, it's got quite a road presence from the front. It's powered by a two litre turbo engine that produces 272 horsepower with 280 pounds feet of torque. And it's straight from the RDX that they do and it also has been used in the Honda Civic Type R so they do mention it sorry I'd forgotten that uh, I read this you, you read these things and it goes in one ear out the other doesn't it but anyway they the 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 crux of, of this product is that it's it's going to hit the market in the States it's going to be very performance orientated but um, we can only hope that that sort of comes they, they they give that a crack in europe honda doesn't i mean i'm really talking from portugal and the uk's perspective yes they're around but they, they're not at what you know they're a popular vehicle but they don't sort of hit the spot quite like the major players do and it's a shame really and i think it, honda in some respects are let down by their infotainment system but the cars are, are beautifully made and this one the interior looks absolutely awesome um i mean i'm a sucker for red sucker for a red leather interior probably wouldn't pitch it with the um red outside but overall i think that, that's a stunner that car looks really nice. So a good article on that one if you want to know a little bit more. And over the page takes us straight to the 2021 Ford F-150 pickup, which is and still is the, la the, the, the fastest selling vehicle in America. And I'm led to believe they sell one every 10 seconds. So, uh, you know, it doesn't take me long to rabbit away and they've sold a couple of them. So um, it's incredible, really, when you think about those sort of volumes. Now, the vehicle, I think you can see that there are a fair few differences, but not quite to the 92 percent. Uh, so they're Ford are saying that in 2021, uh, the vehicle that you see here has 92% of new or revised parts. Although this may look like uh, some sort of Porsche 911 or 911 grade engineering and evolution, um, because it is very similar, but I think we'd all agree it was a good looking truck, so why change it? So the highlights really are it's 1200 pounds plus of towing capacity pretty good fuel economy and a 700 mile driving range from a tank full it also comes with hybrid power 
the onboard system provides a 2.4 kilowatt inverter that delivers 20 amps of 110 volt electricity for powering a job site or campsite. If you need 30 amps of 220 volt power, you can upgrade that to a 7.2 inverter. So the, an, in, an onboard inverter basically takes the 12 or uh, 24 or 48 volt now that some vehicles have and inverts that up into um, a, a 110 if you're in America or a 240 volt system or 222 40 volt system if you're in Europe. They've made quite a lot of improvements to the chassis which increases the rigidity and improves the ride and it's also getting adaptive steering from the Super Duty and it places a motor and gears in between the steering wheel and column to reduce the amount of input needed during low speed maneuvers whilst also re removing the nervousness of the quick ratio steering of the previous model. Uh, and I suppose that if you're driving something that big, it, it, it's it, it's not a European vehicle. I mean, America has uh, long straight roads. It's always been the joke that um, their cars sort of get a bit confused when it comes to a corner, but I'm not sure that's really the case now. Uh, so you are getting quite a lot of other goodies there are, there's obviously a place to stand your hand held device while you're working in the back just in case you want to plug in a saw and um, watch a youtube video of how to do whatever you're doing uh, it has reverse guidance system to allow you to back up onto a trailer and most of those have come down from their Super Duty, which is a monstrously big truck, I think, F350. And uh, screens are all larger. It's got an 8-inch unit, which is standard, and then optional 12-inch system. So a great vehicle. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that wouldn't go well uh, over here in um, sort of southern Europe, because the roads are pretty big, the roads are pretty good, uh, and I'm not sure that something that size wouldn't do quite well, particularly... Um, in the more rural areas of France and Spain and here in Portugal. I th I'm, I'm surprised that they, they don't, but they've got such a massive uh, sales in America, they probably don't need to go anywhere else. But staying with Ford, flipping straight over the page to the 2021 Ford Mustang Mach 1. And obviously if some of you have seen the Mac e which is a, a new sort of uh, electric powered SUV, sticking with the Mac name, um, maybe confuses us but this is obviously the sexy Mustang that uh, most Mustang lovers got a little bit upset when they named an SUV uh, uh, the same vehicle but simply put the the Mustang now is available in right-hand drive in Europe uh, in the UK specifically for, for I think it must have been over a couple of years now so this is sort of a revised one so it's going to interest most of us I think that the the Mustangs are slightly unsung car uh, i've driven one that yeah the plastics are a bit on the um cheaper side but the for what you're getting for the the price you pay i think it's quite an exceptional vehicle but the difference is with this mac one it's getting the shelby's gt350 manual short throw shifter along with the auxiliary oil cooler although the Mustang GT's twin disc clutch will be used, so Mach 1 buyers can also opt for the Ford's terrific 10-speed select shift auto, outfitted with upgraded torque converter for sharper sports shift programming. Uh, the standard Mach 1 gets specifically tuned uh, MagnaRide shock, stiffened steering, shaft, unique power steering calibration, stiffer anti-roll bars, stiffer front springs and a brake booster from the Mustang GT Performance Pack 2 and they're getting all that as standard. Uh, Mac 1 customers will be greeted by logos on the sill plates, new instrument panel finishing, uh, engine tube swirl look called dark spin spin drift, a white cue ball shifter for the manual transmission, a unique splash on the screen of the 12.3 digital cluster and a plaque displaying the car's chassis number. Recaro seats will be an option and standard front seats will feature the horizontal accent stripe. So final pricing. They reckon it's going to be around the $49,000 mark. So what will that translate to Europe? Probably 50, 55,000 in UK sterling, which actually for what you're getting is 
you know it's a supercar really um, fantastic looking machine and it's got an immense amount of road presence. I mean, the rear there, I think, the, from the rear, I think it's a fantastic... Well, I, actually, I, that's, not, that's a stupid thing to say, because it's a fantastic vehicle from all angles. So, um, look out for the Mustang Mach 1 coming to you soon. Now, where do we head to? Uh, ah, this is an interesting one. Now, Mike Connor, um, he's been looking at... The VW group sort of take on electrical vehicle updates. So Porsche will be electrifying the Macan due in 2022, which is possibly a surprise, um, probably a surprise to me. Uh, that's because the Macan is likely to be based on the Volkswagen Group's MEB electric vehicle architecture and not the forthcoming PPE, premium electric vehicle platform, under development of Porsche and Audi. The VW Group has consolidated its EV architecture to just the two, the MEB for vehicles up to the size of an Audi A4 and VW Passat, and the PPE to be built in high and low floor configurations for the premium brand's SUVs. The existing Macan shares the MLB architecture with the current A4, so it's logical to assume the MEB would be used for all electric version rather than the more expensive PPE. There's a lot of, um, or there's probably too many little acronyms in there for, for us to get the gist, but the gist is they've got two uh, electric platforms and they're shoving everything that's up to an Audi A4 size onto the smaller one, which makes fantastic sense. And um, they go on further to say that uh, the Macan is launching as a rear-wheel drive model only, the all-wheel drive version with motors front and rear giving a total of 302 horsepower and 332 pounds-feet of torque. The configuration Porsche would insist on for an electric Macan, um, which certainly will not arrive before very late 2021 or 2022. Um, BMW, rumours out of Munich suggest an all-electric version of the next-gen BMW M5 could hit the road in 2024. The next-gen BMW M5 series, codenamed G60, is scheduled to appear late 2023 and we built on BMW's convergence platform, which allows ICE FEV and BEV. So you've got ICE, which is internal combustion engine, FEV, which is plug-in electric hybrid electric vehicle, and BEV, which is a battery electric vehicle, I believe, but that's coming out the back of my little pea brain. Um, so the vehicles are to share a high proportion of components. Sources say an electric M5 could be powered by three 335 horsepower motors, two at the rear and one at the front, delivering a total system output of just over 1,000 horsepower, all-wheel drive and active torque vectoring across the rear axle. BMW will be aiming for a 0-60 time of 2.7 seconds and a 400 plus mile range. Wow! Um, I think when we see an electric M5, we know the world has changed, hasn't it? And um, we won't be talking about EVs uh, like we do now because they'll just be very normal. And um, then it goes on to mention Rimac, which has delayed production of its hypercar because of the virus. So, um, interesting thing. In I mean, BMW bringing out an EV version of the M5. I think what the bit I miss there is they're bringing an EV version of the M5 out, but will it go alongside uh, the standard internal combustion engine or will that die and it's electric power only? that is going to be some form of interest i think and that's that's when the world changes so moving on um frank marcus uh he's basically done an uh um, um, i'm not sure whether this is an interesting article to all of you but it was mildly interesting to me and um 
basically in May 2019 online insurance uh, company Netquote did a study of swabbing vehicles interior touch points for bacteria in ride hailing vehicles rental cars and taxis then it compared those findings of cultures found on a toilet seat um, so and it says here maybe don't read this while you're having your lunch or don't listen to me while you're having it wouldn't put me off um, now the results are predictable and uh, taxis were 160 times germier than a toilet seat and ride hailing vehicles measured 219 times germier than the taxis uh, so basically um, figuring only germaphobes of the Howard Hughes or Howie Mandel who well, I've actually never heard of I've heard of Howard Hughes uh, so the likes of Howard Hughes or Howie Mandel Inc would care and me because um, I'm a germaphobe I mean I've got no there's no way I can even hide that fact I am I, I love wearing the mask here in Portugal we have to because of the virus I don't think I'm ever going to stop wearing that one I look better in it other than it's hard to find one that goes over this massive beak but um, I, I like I, I love the the um, the uh, alcohol that you use to go I mean it's right up my street I you know I, I can't help myself but basically um, the the article goes on to going through what is filthier than the uh, toilet seat which is sort of pretty obvious and I've seen it on a few different things they're working on ways of, of cleaning the vehicle because of the virus so it's becoming now an issue that shared cars and places that people swap so obviously seats in buses and things like that need to be um, sanitized from the covid virus so people are working on lights and varying ways of, of killing these organisms uh, and probably in taxis it probably should have been done a long time ago but hey a little bit of dirt as my mum always said never killed you but um, yeah who knows anyway moving on now they tend to uh, motor trend tend to always do an interview and, and this one is with Josh Gates now if you don't know who Josh Gates is he's um, the host of Discovery Channel's Expedition Unknown and he's got a rather a nice passion for cars there's a picture of him sitting here in his uh, looks like his Willys Jeep and he's uh, he's an interesting creature if you haven't caught up on some of his product uh, some of his programs they are mildly entertaining to say the least and he investigates legends mysteries that sort of thing from around the world um, getting into digging into tombs and um, lost cities and and basically anything that you find weird like that and he uses a, a, a massive selection of SUVs trucks um, motorcycles and ATVs including helicopters boats and all sorts of things so if you've got any interest in vehicles and going to weird and wonderful places it's it's possible that that's a program you should watch but a good interview so again another reason to buy the Motor Trend magazine I'm not going to go through all of that because it's quite a big one now the letters page always mildly interesting um, majority of things at the moment do tend to revolve around EVs I, I think that um, the world is quite passionate in either hating them or loving them and, and not quite in equal measures I think the haters still probably outweigh the lovers and then there's a huge amount probably like me who fall happily in the middle I, I'm I just like cars so I don't care what they're powered by it can be diesel gas petrol electric um, or a wound up electric uh, elastic band I still find some sort of pleasure in all of them but EVs do interest me I, there's no getting away from it I'm, I'm finding them quite fascinating and because most developments and the things that are being pushed now hardest are something to do with electric power I, I, I tend to read about it and, and look at it and find it very interesting so um, one of the letters here uh, is, is basically about people cross shopping uh, electric and EV vehicles and, and I, I, I think that Peugeot and Citroen and Opel or Vauxhall in the UK are doing it quite right it, it, the course is a great example um, I like you know if I'm a buyer and I like the Corsa I choose the 
quality of the seating that I want in it, the, the finish of it, and then I choose my powertrain. And if I choose electric or petrol, I'm still getting the same vehicle. And probably the only decision I've got to make comes down to cost. And um, that seems to be, that's the, the article here. And uh, basically Motor Trend are, are saying as competitive, because what they're saying is that it, that the Motor Trend are still sort of splitting their articles into um, sort of petroleum based power and electric power rather than just going look let's do a test the fact that it could be an electric car against a petrol car or a diesel car is irrelevant and I tend to think that's where magazines need to get to I think electric power is is here to stay uh, hydrogen power may well find its way forward in the in the coming future and and diesel and uh, petrol gas powered vehicles are here for the foreseeable future uh, and really if someone's bringing out a new vehicle why not test an electric one versus the um, petrol equivalent it, it that's actually relatively interesting in my opinion so that, that's just on the letters page in there uh, there's a few other letters not the most fascinating this month and then of course you get to Bertie Bronco and they have got quite a few pages filled up with with bronco data now i think i've said before in in a review that we did of the bronco both nathan and i are particularly liking this vehicle um there's some some great pictures of it it's starting to look fantastic i think they've been relatively amusing with some of their uh naming so they've got the goat and goat is go over any terrain and they've trademarked that the g dot o dot a dot t dot they've they've trademarked that as um the big broncos rock crawl terrain mode which i find quite interesting then there's the sasquatch which i love in fact i've got a squash sasquatch on my car somewhere um and i i had to look deep to find out what the sas squatch pack is and how it works so basically you've got your different levels of bronco that you can buy and the base one so the the gist from the ford website is that with its body on frame underpinning pinnings standard four-wheel drive and high torque turbocharged engine the base 2021 ford bronco is a formidable off-road machine right out of the box but let's say you want even more road off-road capability from the blue oval's new suv while staying within a budget enter the sasquatch package available across the line except for the wild track version which comes standard with all of its goodies anyway the sasquatch package turns the entry-level bronco into a all-terrain monster their words not mine Credit for the transformation goes to a 17-inch beadlock compatible wheels wrapped in 35-inch mud tyres, an electromechanical transfer case locking the front and rear axles, larger fender flares, additional suspension clearance, heavy-duty blistine shocks. For better or worse, the package requires checking off the optional 10-speed automatic transmission addition. So, the Sasquatch package is basically if you want to do some much more serious off-roading but is only available with automatic transmission whether that bothers you or not as they say pop it in the comments the um, automatic versus manual um, question for serious off-roaders does crop up I'm not sure whether we should do a feature on that and my Wrangler is automatic and Nath's L200 is manual and from my experience automatic is is much better but then I'm not a particularly hardcore experienced off-roader but back to the Bronco see interior shots here that's one seriously big screen it's got in there and it's very very Wrangler um, I think it looks uh, the Wrangler hasn't really evolved I mean obviously I like a Wrangler I own one but it, it, it's kept its Porsche 911 type styling which is it's just a slight evolution and tidying up for each new model rather than just going wow here's something completely new and the Bronco could almost be a modern take on a Wrangler and 
I, c I can't deny I think the the Bronco looks looks awesome and it's it's very Wrangler-esque I like the idea of the three different styles the sport is um, I'm assuming not quite as hardcore it's more uh, Chelsea tractor but still has the capability and the the two-door and the, the sort of four-door main Broncos um, the Badlands edition they're the hardcore versions but it's got a lot more electronics in it than a Wrangler has but I'm assuming they're going to uh, visit that because this is now some serious competition and, and that's great because it's going to push Jeep to up the game with the Wrangler and the Bronco are going to have to keep evolving to attempt to stay level with the Jeep or or get ahead of them so a uh, competition is a great thing really but the Bronco article if you want to know everything about the Bronco then this is a this is a, a really good article there's a lot of pages a lot to go through and a lot of different variants to to discuss too much for me to bore you with I'd have to read the whole pages and uh, my reading's too bad to do that it, you'd, you'd get bored senseless but as soon as you turn the page over you come to Jeep's first response which is basically to really up the game of the Gladiator now the Gladiator's a Wrangler in pickup form really but with a, an extended bed uh, so it, it it's basically stretched the Wrangler to make it a little a little worse if you if you're doing rock crawling because the breakover angles and the 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 pivot point in the center which you can obviously catch the center of the vehicle on on large items as each wheel drops over uh, the the gladiator is a bit worse but what they have done is they've brought out a Mohab um, version and the gist of that is that it's it's really aimed i would say at the um ford raptor which is rather than hardcore off-roading they've um, fitted some serious shocks to it and, and made it a, a sort of fast dirt road weapon and so the article is really saying whether this is worth purchasing over the rubicon but i think in simple terms that they're sort of designed for different people but what they're putting in the magazine here is if you're still wondering why you should buy the Moha over the Rubicon let's say it's a simple yes you should uh, here we have we're losing the Rubicon selectrical front and disconnecting anti-roll bar but it supplements it with virtual brake biased lockers with trick suspension that doesn't need to be disconnected for anything. In almost any situation you can get a Gladiator into, the Moav Virtual Front Locker will get you out nearly as well as a Rubicon's Mechanical Locker. If it be a forest service road you are logging down or to an off-road car park you can do it at high speed in this fantastic Gladiator. For the extra £245 it'll cost you over a Rubicon, it's the best money you will ever spend. It makes it the most expensive Gladiator but it sure is worth it. So that looks like a serious weapon to me. I, I'm, you know, uh, uh, it's got Fox shocks which are absolutely awesome and it just looks a fantastic vehicle so again they're responding already really to the Bronco attack then we're moving to something completely different we've got some supercars we've got here the McLaren 720 Spider, the Mercedes AMG GT Roadster versus the 2021 Porsche 911 Turbo S Cabriolet and three stunning stunning vehicles so um if one of those was offered to you for free no let's say say the dealer said to you you can have this as a year's loan which would you have which would you have pop it in the comments i'll give you my verdict in a minute so gist of it is three convertibles all very expensive um, all can hit 60 by in around 2.8 seconds so they're fairly well matched they're classifying this as more of a fashion show but i think that each car sort of has a very different angle on how it goes about its business to me the mclaren goes about its business in a supercar fashion the mercedes looks like a, a, a proper weapon but a bit more manly is not quite the right word but uh, uh, probably a bit more to handle and the porsche is probably going to be the easier day-to-day -day vehicle to to deal with
Uh, I can't remember quite what they said about it either, even though I didn't read this long ago. So let's have a look. They put them in first, second and third places. Third place goes to the Mercedes AMG GT Roadster. Down on power, high on charm. This AMG most likely beats all convertibles on earth except for these two rivals. Second place goes to the McLaren 720 Spider, a cruise missile with four wheels, pure exotica. The 720S Spider customers will in no doubt crave a 911 turbo for daily driving duty. So I suppose we're coming to the same place that I would have come to. And the Porsche 911 gets first place. An upset win if ever there was one. Porsche is more unrelenting than ever. The new turbo picks up where the GT2 RS left off. I think where Porsche score is the the day-to-day -day use of the vehicle so you've got all that performance all that fun on tap but it drives like a golf gti i suppose and if that then that's a compliment that's not a criticism uh, so that you can get into it nip to the shops or you can really carve the canyon if someone offered me one of those definitely the mercedes would be last mm, exclusive factor i suppose that mclaren possibly wins but i i think i would probably want the porsche i think i would i think the porsche would get it for me although not a not, you know it's not a car i've ever thought about well i can't afford one but i've never really thought about but an old 911 actually would be quite a crack wouldn't it if you if you had a 60s bogo 911 it would be you would look pretty even i might look cool in that mm anyway um let's see what we've got next there's another there's a bit more about a new porsche if you're looking for that they, they've then got um real life crazy cars that inspired hot wheels so hot wheels are kids toys that are a bit out there and you've got an article here showing some of the weird and wacky things that have come out mainly out of the states but there's some blooming crazy looking things here and, and um, the silhouette looks absolutely awesome I mean that's something sort of from my childhood that I remember from the Jetsons I think that takes me to but uh, again they're quite interesting where you know why they were developed and who they were developed for and how they inspired um, Hot Wheels to, to go where they have with their their toy cars and there is a few absolutely fantastic vehicles in there so we then move to the standard part of the magazine where we end up with the cars that um, Motor Trend uh, editors and contributors are running. So they obviously get loaned cars by manufacturers to do regular updates on. So they've just got an arrival of a uh, Subaru Outback. And I have to say that the dash that the Subaru have put in does look rather nice. Uh, that's a, a, a serious improvement from the last time i sat in a subaru which is quite a while ago we haven't got a subaru dealer anywhere near us in portugal um so i haven't sat in one for a couple of years when i i went to one in where was that chichester um so it's a few years i'll have to have a, i'll have to ask nathan if they've got any in lisbon and um actually the subaru is a vehicle you don't see here you don't see here so I'm, I'm not even sure if they're sold in portugal but um i'll look into that they're running a rav4 and really giving a a, a look at the, the standard rav4 against the rav4 hybrid which is a, is a good read they've got the um, bmw that they featured in last month's episode so if you haven't seen that wind yourself back and coming up here today we followed one a brand spanking new one in sort of a very very metallic jade i suppose you'd call it and and there is my problem with the car the arse i, I can't i i don't like it the, i don't know what the the integration of the the boot spoiler into the back of that car is not been elegantly done i think is how i put it at the front i don't like um i've I think I've mentioned it before. It's not a deal breaker for me. The front, the BMW, the big, the big grills. I almost prefer the massive grills that they've put on the new four series. Don't think it looks nice on the X5. Well, and the X7 is grotesque, but the X5, we again, Harry 
um, from Harry's Garage has just got a long-term loan X5 and all in black with a black grille. His looks really, really nice. So if you haven't um, looked at, if you, if, or if you're interested in that, um, Harry's running one, I think, for BMW, giving it to him for six months. So um, check his channel out. But yes, the arse of the, um, the new 2 Series, uh, it's not for me, I'm afraid. So anyway, <clears throat> then they've got a Supra, a Volvo, and an, an interesting one, actually, the 2019 Subaru Ascent. Now, Subaru's renowned for their quality and reliability and they are basically saying it's difficult to evaluate a vehicle when it spends so much time at the dealership so they are really not having great success with this Subaru and Subaru are very very big in the states really big in the states so that is not to get it into Motor Trend magazine and have those sort of problems that is not going to go down well so I would assume Subaru will be doing something to um the car that Motor Trend have got fairly rapidly. Nice position to be in. So that wraps it up. Um, clearly, if you're interested in the Bronco, um, in fact, if you're interested in a fair few good reads, I, I highly recommend the Motor Trend magazine. So um, September's is out. Get your little grubby mitts on it. And um, I'm quite enjoying doing it. It's, it's not too bad. It's, if it's too painful, you turn off, don't you? So um, all I can say again is if you have been watching, thank you.